Thank you for checking out this No Spoilers movie review. This is for the 1981 film, uh, whoops, Dead and Buried. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, this is why I have notes, just in case. Yeah, the 1981 film Dead and Buried, which at the time I'm recording this is available for uh, streaming on the Shutter Streaming service. Uh, this is a Gary Sherman film. Not a lot of people know Gary Sherman as a director, but the things he's known for that he did, Raw Meat, also known as Deathline, which I do have saved uh, on Shutter in my list to watch. Uh, it was recommended to me at one point. And Poltergeist 3. So there you go. So Gary Sherman getting it done. Uh, so Dead and Buried is actually not a film I've really heard of, even though it's an 80s film. And I actually kind of liked it. Like I thought it was a, it was a pretty solid film. And I've never heard anyone talk about it, like, ever. So I was kind of surprised when I checked it out, and I was like, this is actually good. Why has no one ever said anything about this? So, I don't know. Uh, so this film is actually based on a novel by a woman by the name of Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough. Uh, just throwing that out there. And Jack Albertson is in this film. A lot of people were probably just say, like, I don't know who Jack Albertson is. And I didn't really know who he was either until I looked into it. And he was Grandpa Joe in the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And he, has a, he does a really good job in this film. I will actually say that he is the strongest actor with the most enjoyable performance in Dead and Buried. So look out for Jack Albertson if you're going to check out this film. He does a delightful job in, this, in his role. Um, so the, this movie actually starts and it's very terribly boring in the very, very beginning, like for the first bunch of minutes, maybe like mm, first, like five minutes or so. And then all of a sudden it gets very real, very fast and quite interesting. And you're just like, okay, you got my interest. Let's, uh, proceed because it, it starts just like so excessively mundane and slow. And I was just like, oh no, this is not a good sign. What is going on here? And then all of a sudden, it's just like, boom, now something's happening. Now you're interested. Let's get engaged and go through this thing. So I really like how they did that twist kind of real fast. Um, so the setting of this is kind of like a small town type thing, and that's one of the main themes behind it. But uh, it definitely feels like a small, sleepy coastal town. And I think it's supposed to be in Rhode Island, if I'm not mistaken. I, at one point, there was a reference to Providence, Rhode Island. So I don't know if this is supposed to be close to Providence, uh, but I think it's supposed to be in Rhode Island. So it, 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 they did a really good job of actually making it look and feel like a sleepy northeastern coastal town. Um, and that's a cool aesthetic. It really is. And they also um, had a bunch of fog in the film to, to kind of bolster that. And here comes the fog rolling in off the ocean. Uh, and it just kind of feels that way. But having it appear to be a very sleepy coastal town actually makes it seem very desolate as well, which really helps with this actual story that they're trying to tell. Um, it also makes it seem more kind of creepy, scary. If it looks a little more empty, a little more desolate, um, a little more dead, if you will. <laughs> uh, there's a con there's a constant foggy haze, which adds to the ambiance, like I was saying. Uh, Robert England is in this, by the way, in a very, very small role, but he does have some dialogue, and it's always, always a joy to see Robert England, especially a younger version of Robert England, because most people just know him as Freddy Krueger, but FYI, he's done other films, people. He has. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, so... There was uh, one of the things I really thought about, because sometimes when I'm watching films, I'll see something in the film, and that makes me think past that to other films as well. And in this instance, there was a, a guy who was drunk in the film, or, you know, acting drunk in the film. And it re just reminded me that when drunk drunkenness is portrayed in films, especially in films, you know, like pre-2000s, it's very campy. It's very over the top. It's it's like crazy exaggerated. And that's really on display in this film when that drunk guy is happening. You're just like, people who are drunk don't act that way. It's not that over the top. It's not that co comedic and ridiculous. But it just made me think that like overall, that is something that happens. People, when they're acting drunk, don't really act drunk very well. It's not very um, convincing, if you ask me. 
Uh, everything seems very desolate in this, even a hospital. And that's kind of when I started really thinking about how desolate everything seemed in the film is when there's a scene inside of a hospital and there's like nobody in the hospital pretty much. It's like three people, I think, maybe four. And then it's just like, who's running this hospital? Do they have patients? Is it just that nobody gets hurt? And maybe that's actually part of the story. I don't know. But it does add to the overall feel, which I really like. Um, and it makes, I wrote that it makes it seem like the, the town is hollow because, you know, hollow halls everywhere. Uh, the acting delivery of one of the characters, by the way, really tips the hand of the story in this film, and it's pretty early on. So hopefully, if you're watching this film, you don't pick up on that, but, but there's the the acting style of this one person, their delivery is so, um, how do I want to put it? I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's bad. It's just giving things away. It, it's very much like, like heavy, heavy, heavy winking. And I really don't think they should have allowed that. The director definitely, Gary Sherman, definitely should have allowed that. He should have reshot that numerous times and be like, look, we want to maintain some mystery in this. We don't want people being able to know at least a portion of what the end story is going to end up being when we try to do a big reveal. Because you want that big reveal to have impact, obviously. And with what this character was doing, I was just like, I'm pretty sure I know one of the big things that's going to be revealed in this because of this person's acting. That delivery is just awful for this. So that's really something that was bothersome to me. I was like, what was happening? I was like, really we're doing this okay um almost everyone in this film ask acts suspicious which actually really helps with holding this uh tension throughout the film because it's like it's that kind of thing it's like who's a problem person who's not like who can i trust who can i not trust is someone just gonna all of a sudden uh you know kill somebody like what's going on who's good who's bad type of thing and um, I think that plays very strongly into what the overall story is. So I really like that aspect of it. Uh, one of the other things <laughs> that hit me with this film is they need a warning in the beginning because there's a lot of, uh, well, not a lot, but a decent amount of scenes where there's like severe flashing lights. So they need that epileptic warning. Like if you have seizures, if you have epilepsy, uh, you might want to be warned because there's going to be some crazy flashing lights in this. And I was just like, me personally, I was turned off by it. It was a lot because it was like flashing lights, like right into the camera. So you're just like, ugh, ugh. So I was watching on my laptop, which is what I record these videos on. And like the entire screen is just like flashing. And I'm just like, <sighs> it's crazy. Um, the uh, So the practical effects are good in some of this, like really good in some of this, honestly, especially considering that it was 1981. Um, and there's some really gruesome kills in this. Like when the practical effects are really good, it's for really gruesome deaths or, or, or maims or kills. And it's just, it's pretty enjoyable for that reason. I was very, very, very impressed with the level of practical effects for this. And like I said, for 1981 especially, I was pretty, pretty impressed. Uh, the film kind of speaks to complicated relationships that humans have with death. Uh, there's this kind of dichotomy of like fear versus fascination with death. And I think it kind of, you know, like that's a theme to this film. Like the overall story hints at this, you know, how people do feel conflicted with that. Like, they, they have an interest about death, but at the same time, they're very much afraid of it. Which, you know, as a human being, I can definitely understand that, and I'm sure everyone watching this can as well. Uh, so I found that very interesting. And it also speaks to the fear of thinking that you know people, and you really don't. And to a degree in this film, also thinking that you know yourself personally, and you don't necessarily. And kind of the the shock and, and the how everything gets turned on its head once you find out that, you know, people aren't who you think they are or you aren't who you think you are. Um, I mean, it, it's about the worst version of discovery, discovery of other, other people, discovery of yourself. And uh, that's a very real thing. So I really like how the theme and the story ties into that real life struggle. So, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, that's it for me. Not a, not a super long review. Um, 
because the film, I mean, the pacing is a little slow-ish, but I think it actually works. It's not too long. I think it's like an hour and a half film, which makes sense for horror films. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, looking at this film on a five-star scale with half stars in play, I'm going to give it, I'm, I think I'm going to have to just give it a solid three. Uh, I was kind of between a three and a three and a half, but I think it's a little more towards the three than it is the three and a half. So um, if I did quarters, I would view it three and a quarter, but three stars on this one. I would recommend checking it out just because I think it's worth seeing once, especially because of, uh, who's it, Jack Albertson? Yeah, Jack Albertson's performance. Plus, um, it's kind of funny if you're a big fan of the old Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory to see Grandpa Joe being someone totally different. He's actually a mortician in this, and he's very enjoyable. So, um, But it's just funny to be like, Grandpa Joe, mortician. Grandpa Joe, mortician. Uh, so anyway, for, for no other reason than that, just check it out. But it is a solid film. So thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Please do me that favor. I always ask for it, but if you're holding off on doing it, please don't because it means a lot to me, and it, it's not an inconvenience to you. Just hit that subscribe. Just a second of your time. I would appreciate that. Anyway, put some comments down there. Are you familiar with Dead and Buried? What is your idea or what is your feeling on this film? Because like I said, I didn't really hear anything about this film from anyone ever. So I would like to hear from some people right now. Have you seen this and what are your thoughts on it? Am I alone in thinking this is actually worth seeing? I don't know. Uh, you can give me some thumbs up if you like, but I'd rather have the subscri the subscription or sub get that subscribe going. Anyway, Thank you for checking out this video, and until next time, keep it brutal.